I find that it's better to uh, adapt this course to the way you think rather than impose the way I think on you. And since many of the questions that you have raised anticipate uh, the materials I'm going to cover, all it means is I'm going to take it out of order, uh, essentially at your request. So um, one of the things I really hope that you'll do is provide me with your feedback. And to that end, I know I gave out these little questionnaires for the first class. I forgot to bring them for, this, for the last class, so I'm going to hand out two today to everyone to fill out, if you don't mind. You know, this is not mandatory. It, all it does is help me, so you may not want to do it, but I'm sorry. Oh, great, thanks. There's two there. There's, you know, there, there, there are two of them. There's one for the last class and one for this class. Um, obviously, if you weren't at the last class, then, um, well, you can fill it out if you want, but um, your comments will be weighted uh, against the fact that you weren't here. But anyhow, I really, I really find these useful, not only because I try to adapt the class um, to you, but it lets me know which way your, your minds are going, whether you're getting it, <laughs> and um, whether I'm going too, fa too fast or too slow. Or... So, like I said, as a favor to me, if you have the time, you know, this is MIT, it's all about data points. Data points, data points, data points, data points. So, um, with that in mind, um, I want to start this class by covering some of the questions that um, I received from students in the last couple of classes, um, both of, all of which I found to be very useful. Um, and I think that this is the way, like I said, this is, this is the way to knowledge. Knowledge is the accidental byproduct of discussion fueled by curiosity. So this is the curiosity part. And hopefully what we'll do is turn it into knowledge by discussing it. So one of the first questions I got from uh, folks in this class, and this was uh, repeated a number of times, is how long do intellectual property rights last? Um, we've been talking about various types of intellectual property, patents, trademarks, copyrights, design patents. There are also plant, plant and animal patents. So there are various types of patents. Um, we talked about the Bible. We talked about expiration of copyright. So I think that that general discussion was responsible for uh, generating this question. So I thought it might be useful if I sort of covered um, the terms of various intellectual property rights. Um, first um, is utility and plant patent, patents. And this would also include animal patents. Uh, nowadays, we're patenting living things that are developed or cloned in laboratories. So uh, as technology moves on, the types of intellectual property that need to be protected changes, of course. Uh, and in the United States, when it comes to utility patents and plant patents, um, for, everything, for everything that was filed after June 8, 1995, which is probably when most of you were born, um, so you don't need to be concerned about anything uh, much before that, the term of the patent is uh, 20 years from the date of filing. Now remember, in the United States, we're a first-to-file a, a country now, which is different than it used to be. Uh, and the term of the patent is, uh, begins when the preliminary patent application is filed. So um, the clock begins to tick when you file your preliminary uh, patent application. Now, the, the terms of these patents can be extended for various reasons. One of the things that people often do, because it takes time to uh, uh, process a pre preliminary patent application, is they convert 
several pre preliminary patent applications into a final patent. And in that case, the clock begins to run when the final patent uh, application is approved. So uh, it depends on you know, how many preliminary patent applications are being incorporated into one patent or whether the preliminary application uh, is for one particular process or invention. Um, generally speaking, though, the term is 20 years from the date that you file your application. Um, design patents, does anybody, um, does anybody know what a design patent is? Oh, okay, I'm sorry, let me have your questions, I apologize. Oh, I was gonna say like the Coca-Cola shape. Gee, how did, uh, how, did, how did you think of that? <laughs> Absolutely. That, that, Oh, you didn't see them. Okay. Well, you 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 uh, you anticipate a part of the lecture. Sure. All right. Uh, that's a design. That's a design. Any any ornamental object that also has a functional purpose uh, is considered uh, eligible for a design patent. And that's different than a utility patent. Um, although, as we'll talk about later, you can have both. And the term for a design patent um, uh, is. Um, uh, 15 years. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is the United States Patent and Trademark Office doesn't tell you when your patent is going to expire. So if you own a patent or if you want to find out when somebody else's patent will expire and you're wondering about that, you go to the USPTO website and they actually have a uh, app that you can, you know the old saying, there's an app for that? You can download the app, and it's called a patent term calculator. And all you do is fill in the information from the USPTO website or from your own application, and it'll tell you when your patent is going to expire. And that's a really important thing, especially for uh, companies or persons who are looking to build on another patent or looking for when a particular patent will expire and the device moves into the, into the public domain. So um, everything you need to know about when a patent expires or even how to file one, you can find on the USPTO website. It's really user friendly and it's intended actually for inventors. It's not uh, something that is too complicated. So um, I urge you to go on the USPTO website and just kind of uh, uh, look around there sometime. But they actually have a patent term app uh, calculator on the USPTO website. All right, as I said, the design patent is uh, 14 year, 15 years. How about copyrights? We talked a lot about copyrights earlier uh, this week. Um, what's the term for a copyright? The term for a copyright, if the author is known, is 70 years past the life of the author. So if you write a work, um, when, does the when does the copyright begin for when you, when you create a, a uh, uh, something that can be copyrighted. When does it begin? If you write, if you write a, a, a program or if you write a music, a, a, a musical song, when does, the, when does the copyright begin? I would guess if you were, uh, it, uh, no, um, the, the, as we discussed last time and, and as we talked about, it begins when you take that piece of, take that pencil and put it to paper. As soon as, so if you're writing a paper, as soon as you write a sentence, that's when the copyright begins. So you're protected from that moment on. If you, if you, um, if you write a piece of software and you save it to the memory of the computer, that's when it's, that's when it's uh, protected. A copyright is protected as soon as the idea takes tangible form. So whether it's written down, whether it's recorded, whether it's photographed, whether it's uh, saved on a computer uh, memory, as soon as it takes tangible form, you are protected. And, and that's internationally. Uh, you don't have to file with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Um, you have rights from the moment that you pick that pencil up from your piece of paper or press save uh, on your computer. That uh, creates a copyright. Now. That copyright will last for your lifetime plus 70 years. Is it, is, does anybody have any idea why we have the copyrights last more than the lifetime of the author? 
what would you want to do if you were the author of, let's say, a song called Happy Birthday? Think about what an intellectual property right is. Does anybody own a house? Does anybody own a piece of furniture? Exactly. A, a, an intellectual property right is a right, a tangible right to a piece of property. It's as real as this desk, the building that we're sitting, they're standing here in. It's as real as these soda bottles, this computer. A, you have to think of intellectual property as a tangible thing. And what can you do with tangible things? One of the things you can do with them is you can pass them down to your descendants. Another thing you can do with tangible things, what happens when you have a house and you decide to buy a new house? Yeah. You sell it, exactly. And, and sell it, hopefully, for a profit. So a, a piece of intellectual property is something that you can sell for a profit. And so the reason why it lasts for, one of the reasons why it lasts for more than the lifetime of the uh, author is so that you can pass those rights on to someone in, in a way that they'll be useful. Sure, yes, sir. So why is it different? You, you, well, it, go, it, it goes back um, to literally the Statute of Anne uh, that was drafted by Parliament in 1710. Uh, generally speaking, uh, these laws, which are drafted by legislators, um, legislators are social architects. And what they have to do is they have to do a balancing of what's best for society. And when it comes to intellectual property rights, um, what they balance is the right to protect the creator of the intellectual property, the inventor, the, the person that invented the mousetrap. They have to have an opportunity to get their money back on, on their investment. Uh, but the other thing about intellectual property is that our entire well-being as a society depends upon the development of intellectual property. No intellectual property, no advancement. Our entire society is based upon the advancement of science. And so if we give exclusive rights to an invention or some scientific uh, invention or creation uh, and prevent it from being um, uh, going into the public domain, then we're depriving everyone of the benefits of that. And so as, as the legislature sits there and considers these competing interests, uh, they, um, as our elected representatives, um, decide the terms of these patents. Now, the reason why they're 20 years is basically all of the countries in the world have sort of got together and in sort of this patchwork framework have basically decided that 20 years is about the term that um, everybody is uh, agreeable to. So these terms are not only developed as a, as a, as a concept of uh, the laws of individual countries, but they're, they're developed as part of a framework of international agreements. And so when it comes to patent technology, it's 20 years. Same thing goes for uh, copyright technology. Brian. I have a question as it relates to student textbooks. So what happens if there is a second edition or third edition and they add another author into a later edition? If uh, it's the last surviving person. Sure. Um, it's, uh, that's an excellent question. The question, and of course the answer, as, as, um, as I think I've mentioned uh, when it comes to law, uh, the answer is it depends. Um, if, this, if the subsequent edition has input or some creative input from another author, um, I would say that that's a separate copyright. Um, most likely with a separate author, there are going to be changes to the text. So in gen generally speaking, that would be a separate copyright. Um, as, as different editions are, are created, if it's simply a reprint of a prior edition, it probably does not qualify for a new copyright. But if there is any change at all, any updating, uh, and usually what publishers do is they update it in some way, and it, all, it only has to be infinitesimal. The tiniest change qualifies it for the, for, satisfies the originality uh, requirement. We'll get to that. 
So the, the clock begins to run when the second edition or the third edition or the fourth edition. I think maybe you, know, you can see why publishers uh, uh, create serial editions. It enables them to extend the copyright on a particular work. Uh, you can basically hold on to something basically forever if you're willing to uh, create new editions. Yes, sir? What about the rights to the first edition, though? Well, after 70 years, or if it's anonymous, after 95 years, or what is it, 120 years if the, uh, from the date of creation, um, in those cases, after that the expiration of that period of time, it goes into the public domain. So if they're making minor changes then. Let's say all, theoretically, all that someone can be concerned about is the first edition. They're just minutia that they have altered. Exactly. It's kind of, this is one of those uh, examples of where the value of things become inverse. You know, if you have a first edition of a Shakespearean work, that's a very valuable piece of tangible property. But the intellectual property has long since gone in to the public domain. Yes, sir? When you say it goes to the public domain, the way I understand it is if somebody can take, you know, um, and then uh, let's say if you have a book, they can make that book and sell it. So who's going to get the benefit of selling the book that goes to the public domain? Well, who would buy anything that's in the public domain? Okay. I wouldn't. I would just go to the internet. <laughs> and hit copy and paste, or read it right there. Yes, sir? So you mentioned that the advancement of technology is you know, critical for societies to grow and build. Have, has there been any consideration for different industries maybe shortening that, um, that time span of 20 years? So, uh, for example, I, I see pharmaceutical companies with sky-high profits who have these patents on these drugs, and they're able to charge you know, extremely high profit on them. So. Yeah, and they, and they would argue that they need longer terms in order to recoup the hundreds of millions that they invest. And if you, if, if you, if you, look, at the, if you look at the legislative history of the, of the, um, uh, the Patent uh, and Copyrights Act, it's full of uh, stuff about uh, how we need to extend or, or shorten these things. Um, and, um, you know, the, the legislature takes it into consideration and, and makes, their, uh, makes their decision. But there are lots of uh, 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 arguments both ways. And as we'll show, I'll, because this gets to a question Brian asked after class last time that we're going to cover, there are ways of kind of doing an end run around. Uh, in fact, that's one of the reasons why I brought these here today. Uh, there, there are creative ways of making an end run around the short term uh, for design and, um, and utility patents. Any other questions? Yes, sir. And so if a book comes up with a new edition that has just uh, minor changes, and the first edition, um, the copyright of the first edition expires, yes. the parts that are not changed are still covered by the copyright of the new edition? If, there, the if there is sufficient change, the first edition goes into the public domain. Yes. So that's gone. The second edition, if it has changed, if it meets the originality requirement, which we'll cover, and, and it really is a small amount of originality needed, uh, perhaps you know um, uh, some commentary, uh, something like that, an update. Uh, yes, for instance, I've seen books that are exactly the same, but just a chapter added at the end. Well, that's, that's, that's a new copyright. But all the chapters before, are they covered by the new copyright? New copyright. Not? Yep. And so technically they are not in the public domain. The, the first edition is. The second edition is not, even though much of the text is identical. The second, the second one is copyrighted. Remember, the, the, the word copyright means right to copy. And that means the entire, the entire document. Okay, and that's why the and that's why the copyright covers the entire document, and and that that goes for music, that goes for software. Imagine updating software. Well, the first part of the software usually uh, could perhaps go into the public domain, or maybe it was created before 1974, before they had um, protection for it. But if you build on it, if you improve it, that entire uh, piece of software is is copyrightable. My question was just on these dates, like 1974 and. What makes these dates important? 
You mean you, you mean for? for uh, yeah, here you said 1978, but you just said 1974 for software. Remember, there, there was no Copyright Act prior to 1974. The first Copyright Act was enacted in the United States in 1974. Uh, 1978 is the, the date of the latest Copyright Act. So every now and then, Congress overhauls the intellectual property laws. They recently overhauled the, the patent uh, laws, which required us now to be a first-to-file state. That was a huge change. So periodically, Congress overhauls the intellectual property laws governing contract, trademark, and patents, and that's why that date is important. Because that's the date on which this, was, this, this uh, term was established, and, and it applies today. That law is still good today until Congress changes its mind, and then I'll be putting up another date up there. Okay? Yeah? So you mentioned that we're a first-to-file country uh, several times now. What were we beforehand? Well, before it was uh, the first to invent. And it was always a big uh, thing in order to determine when there was a conflict uh, between own, uh, pe people that believe they owned a particular device. They would have to prove through notebooks and uh, laboratory data, when it was that they first came up with this. Th this was at the heart of the CRISPR decision. CRISPR was a pre-first-to-file uh, patent uh, dispute. And so in the, in the trial of that case, they were bringing in notebooks and showing the experiments that they ran for gene editing uh, out at the University of California. And the uh, Broad Institute here at MIT was showing the work that they did. And it was the judge, it was the, dur uh, the duty of the court in that case, the jury in that case, to decide who was the first to invent. We don't have to worry about those uh, disputes anymore because now we're first to file. Uh, you know, whatever the date stamp is on your, on your preliminary patent application, you know, whoever wins the, the rush to the, the race to the uh, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office wins. Even if you thought of it before, your competitor. So two, two inventors, one comes up with the idea uh, two years ago, somebody comes up with the idea today, they both go to the Patent and Trademark Office, the person that came up with the idea last is first to file, they own the patent. And that's the way it is in the United States, and that's the way it is all over the world now. We, we had to be brought kicking and screaming into the 21st century as far as patent uh, technology was concerned, but now we're, uh, now we're there. Um, trademarks. Uh, the ter anybody know uh, what a, tr can you think of an idea or give me an example of a trademark? Anybody at all? <laughs> anybody think of anything, you know, um, that might constitute a trademark? This is someone with a very nice MIT uh, sweatshirt back there. Can you think of a trademark? Can you point to a trademark near and dear to your heart? Exactly. <laughs> Literally near, maybe not dear to your heart, but literally near to your heart. Yes, that's an example of a trademark. And MIT owns that trademark, and heaven help you if you violate uh, MIT's trademark. But also, you know, Pepsi and Coca-Cola are examples of trademarks. The cool thing about trademarks is I never get a chance to, uh, to use the blackboard. But how long do trademarks last? Infinity. That's right. The cool thing about trademarks is that they can literally last forever. When, once you register a trademark with the USPTO, there are certain technical requirements that you have to follow. You have to re-register, essentially, uh, every, periodically. Uh, you file uh, what's called an affidavit of continuous use. But so long as you continue to use your trademark, so long as you continue to use it in, in commerce, and so long as you don't abandon it, it's yours forever. Uh, and that's the cool thing about trademarks. And it's one of the ways that companies get around the shorter time limits that we've been talking about. Um, can anybody think of a company that maybe has used a uh, trademark in order to circumvent the, cer the, the shorter time periods for patents uh, and, um, and copyrights? Can anybody think of a company? Anybody think of any company at all? Exactly, Coca-Cola. And I'll tell you why uh, I I as we go along. All right, the next qu class question I have, oh, by the way, when it comes to trademarks, 
If you're going to trademark something, let's say you have a business card that you want to trademark and a unique design, all right, one of the things that you can do, uh, obviously, first, what you want to do is you want to register it with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. You go on your website, you can upload the image, file the application fee of 100 bucks, 150 bucks, whatever it is now, and they'll examine your trademark to see whether or not it uh, conflicts with anyone. Assuming it doesn't conflict with any existing trademarks, you'll be granted the rights to that trademark through infinity, so long as you uh, keep uh, uh, reapplying. But the, uh, or um, filing your application for your affidavit of continuous use. But one of the things you can do is go to the USPTO trademark uh, site and go on the site and look at trademarks to see if your trademark conflicts with any other existing trademarks. Um, and we'll talk about uh, infringement of trademarks. There's a whole body of law out there. You know, Adidas, uh, Coca-Cola, you know, uh, Microsoft, Apple. There's an enormous amount of litigation out there involving uh, fights over trademarks. So one of the things you have to do whenever you register a trademark is make sure it doesn't infringe on somebody else's. And the way you do that is you can actually look at the USPTO website and they'll show you trademarks that are similar. And by the way, it's not like, it's not like looking up a domain name. When it comes to domain names, you know, in order to get a domain name, um, if there's any difference in the domain name, you can own it. Um, when it comes to trademarks, it's more like hand grenades. Uh, you know, uh, close counts. So while domain names have to be precise in order for you to acquire the rights to a domain name, when it comes to a trademark, if it resembles but is not exact, it probably infringes. So that's why it's always good to examine the USPTO website to see if your trademark uh, in any way infringes with something owned by Coca-Cola or Pepsi because you want to avoid uh, doing that. All right, second question I got was, were there any efficient ways to determine if someone is protected the idea before? <clears throat> is there an efficient way to determine if someone has protected an idea before? How would you, as a student, as an entrepreneur, figure out whether or not something has been protected? Yes, sir. Google it. Yeah, that's a great idea, exactly. What other ways there to, 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 to find out if something's protected? Can you think of it? Let me see, can I see that MIT shirt? Okay, so, so there's, what I was looking for is one of these things. Anybody seen these logos before? You know what they stand for? Okay, I'll give you two guesses what TM stands for. What does that stand for? Exactly, trademark. And um, what's the R in the circle stand for? Anybody know? Has anybody seen that before? Registered. Exactly, registered. It's a registered trademark. Mm -hmm. So a trademark can be registered and it may not be registered. Any, any trademark or logo that you begin using is your intellectual property. It's not necessary for you to, to register it. Uh, unless, of course, you get into a dispute and you want to enforce the rights, then you need to register it but, um, under federal law. But if it's registered with the USPTO, then the R with the circle applies. Anybody know what the C with the circle applies to? Anybody seen that in the first page of a book you've, re you've read le recently? Anybody read books anymore? I don't know. Um, but yeah, that stands for copyright. Um, and. Um, uh, SM, anybody have any idea what SM stands for? Sur it stands for service mark. And that's the same as a trademark, but instead of pertaining to a product, it pertains to a service. Give you, anybody give me an example of a service mark that you've heard of? About the American College of uh, Pediatrics, American Medical Association. Um, that's, that's, it, that's an idea, that's an example of a service mark. Okay, so the, uh, what is a copyright? The term, uh, as we've discussed, has come to be, what it basically means is you have the right to copy. And this is an example of the symbol for a copyright. Uh, now, um, uh, way back in the olden days, uh, when copyright was uh, first uh, uh, begun, uh, the author of a, of a copyright had to uh, uh, write a long uh, phrase on their, on their creative work. 
Um, they, um, uh, what they had to do is, I want to try to find it. Um, they had to write, entered according to act of Congress in the year by AB in the office of the Librarian of Congress at Washington. That's according to the 1802 Copyright Act. You can see that that would be a little cumbersome when it came to wanting to copyright a book, but think about a painting or a sculpture. Uh, think about almost anything other than a book. That really becomes cumbersome. As time has gone by, what Congress has done is they've shortened the phrase that you had to uh, use in order to denote a copyright uh, item. And in fact, at one point, they finally allowed uh, uh, artists to print the uh, C uh, on whatever was framing their work of art or their photograph. It, it, you know, if you look at any photograph that you, that you Google, um, you'll find that they usually, the author or the owner of the act, uh, of, the, uh, of the photograph, will have, a, um, uh, will have some indication on there that it's copyrighted or protected intellectual property. Yes, sir. You know, you mentioned that when you, 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 know, you start writing a book, and then you start writing down on paper and you put that. That's right. Okay, what about if I have an idea? Let's say I want to, I want to design a website or something like that. And then uh, one of my friends comes, and I let him know about the idea, and then he goes behind me and uh, actually make his own. Uh-huh. So when you say, what wait, nothing. Unless you enter into a non-disclosure agreement with you, um, intellectual property rights do not attach until the idea is expressed in a tangible form. So it has to be on a piece of paper. It has to be on the RAM of a computer. It has to be photographed. It has to be recorded electronically or by sound. While it's an idea, it's not protected. That's why we have non-disclosure agreements. Because you sit down with someone and you say, hey, I have a great idea. Well, what protects you from their going out and expressing that idea in tangible form and owning your idea is the non-disclosure agreement. Never talk to anybody about your great ideas until you have a non-disclosure agreement. And what if I put it written down and the piece of paper is uh, stolen? Well, you're going to have a hard time proving it. Um, you have the intellectual property right, but I don't think you're going to win your case because you're not going to be able to hand me a piece of paper to show to the court proving that that idea has been expressed in a tangible form. So do you suggest to write ourselves an email with all the ideas? Uh, so that we... Oh, that's one way of doing it. Can not a bad idea. Know? Why not? Why not? A better idea would be to express it in some formal way and register it with the, uh, with the uh, Patent and Trademark Office. You know. Uh, but that's one way uh, when it comes to copyright. Uh, that would not work with patents, design patents, animal patents, plant patents. But as far as copyrights are concerned, you know, that, that works. How do you know if something's patented? Well, have you ever seen this before? You know, oftentimes you can buy one of these stamps actually at, uh, I, I checked, at Staples, you know. Um, have you ever seen this before? Patent pending. What does that mean? It means, the docu it means the invention has not yet been patented, the patent has not been approved, but an application for the patent has been um, uh, filed. And this is, this is a notice to the world that what you're looking at is the intellectual property of someone else. That's why they have these, these things on the, on the documents. Yes, sir? Right, another question. Yeah. Um, you just mentioned that you get a patent in. Yep. So if someone in Germany by the time my patent uh, gets approved, he come up with something like that, that he gets approved before mine. Who, who gets the... Nowadays, it's the, the person that filed first. Whoever, whoever won, wins the race to the USPTO, whether it's in the United States or in, or in Germany, whoever wins the, the race to the, uh, to the patent office owns the patent. If you're there 10 seconds after the other guy, you lose even if you thought of it five years before. That's why everybody files preliminary patent applications as soon as they conceive of the idea in order to fix that in time so that they own that. And those things can be amended and changed over time, so you don't even have to, it, the idea doesn't have to be fully developed. That's why everybody does it. Yes, sir? And 
in case uh, two people uh, from opposite side of, uh, of the world uh, have kind of the same idea, not exactly the same, but similar ideas. I mean, I think uh, that it's highly unlikely, but casualty can happen. How does it work in that case? Whoever wins the race to the court, to the to the steps of the patent office. That's it. It has to be in tangible form. If it's an idea, it's worthless. It's worthless. No matter how good your idea is, it's worthless. It has to be in tangible form, expressed in tangible form, and in the case of patents, it has to be filed. Otherwise, you're out. Yes, sir. You said everyone does that, but is that, is that entirely true? Because isn't that why trade secrets exist? Well. Uh, well, trade secrets cover a whole other area of intellectual property. For instance, the formula to, to Coca-Cola is a trade secret um, because recipes and formulas generally are not patentable. But companies treat them as trade secrets, and there are only three people in the world that know the formula to Coca-Cola. It literally is written down and kept in a vault at Coca-Cola, and it's been that way since 1863, I think. Um, however, however long it's been. So there, are, there, are, there is a whole other realm of intellectual property besides patents, copyrights, and trademarks called, into, called um, uh, trade secrets. But in order for it to be a trade secret, it has to be secret. You can't disseminate it. You can't publish it. If you publish it, it's not a trade secret. It's not protected anymore. But if somebody comes up with the, with the formula for Coca-Cola and they did nothing, nothing, to publish that formula, uh, and they come up with it um, by violating the trade secret, Coca-Cola can enforce those rights. In other words, you break into Coca-Cola, you open up the vault, you take the formula out, you photograph it, you bring it back, you, you start your own company. Coca-Cola has a right to enforce that intellectual property, or the theft of that intellectual property. Okay, But it's not protectable unless you treat it like a secret. And it also has to have commercial application. It can't just be, you know. Brian. You have an NDA, and the company has a spin off or in some way changes the name of operating business under. Is the NDA still enforceable? Depends on the NDA. I've seen one sentence NDAs, which, are, uh, which would cover everything, and I've seen other NDAs, which, you know, are very specific and limited. Uh, if uh, you come to my office and you want, and someone's asking you to sign an, an MDA, I'm going to try to get that MD, NDA to be as limited as possible uh, because I don't want to give away your rights. Uh, then again, if you're the owner of the company and you say, Steve, I want your firm to design an NDA for me that will fully protect us, it's probably going to be pretty broad. So it depends on the NDA. Always read the NDAs. Never sign anything you don't understand. All right. Um, <clears throat> so the United States Patent and Trademark Office is the federal agency that's responsible for determining whether or not uh, a particular invention qualifies. Uh, and since the underlying purpose of a patent uh, is to protect the inventor's rights to a unique invention, um, s similar inventions won't receive a, 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 a second patent. Uh, so. The point of that is that when you're filing a patent application or preliminary patent application, it's essential for you to go to the USPTO website and re research their database. Well, let's say you've invented a new bottle. You literally go to the USPTO uh, website, you look up bottles, and you look at all the state of the art, all of the patents that exist for bottles out there. And you find out whether or not your innovation is sufficiently original to qualify for patent, uh, patent recognition. If it's the same as something someone has already done, it's unlikely that you're going to get a patent for it. And the way, in order to determine that, you literally go to the USPTO website and look it up. Now, there are companies that actually perform this function, this service. So um, this is a very complex area of uh, intellectual property law in some cases. And so there are companies that perform patent searches in order to determine the state of the art and see what's out there. So that's one of the things that you, uh, that you are if, if you have a very valuable idea, you may hire someone to do for you to de determine whether or not it's patentable. Um, going back to more class questions, terminology can vary so broadly. How can we tell if an idea is truly original? And this brings us to the threshold of originality concept in, um, 
uh, in uh, intellectual property law. It's uh, originally or literally a concept in copyright law that is used to determine whether or not a particular work can be copyrighted. Uh, it is used to distinguish works that are sufficiently original to qualify for protection. If it's just a copy of something else, if there's no originality, no innovation, no changes, if nothing is added to it, then it's not copyrightable. But as, as, as we've discussed, uh, if there is new content, something different or new or innovative about it, it probably satisfies the originality requirement and can be protected. Um, originality has always been part of patent law as well. Uh, it bars patents that are obtained by copywriting from somebody else or somebody else's patent. Like I said, you always search the, uh, the database of the USPTO to make sure that um, your invention has, satisfies the originality requirement. Uh, if it's just what somebody else has already come up with, and oftentimes people come up with uh, contemporaneously the same idea, uh, it's not protectable if somebody has beat you to the, uh, beat you to the uh, um, patent office. Class questions still. There appear to be three broad categories of materials that can be protected. The manufacturing process, the material itself, and the application of the material. Is each subject to the same protections? What do you think? We've already been talking about this, but it's long been permissible for, to protect uh, uh, different aspects of a product under different bodies of IP law. And I think, Brian, this gets to what you were talking about to me. Um, there's a tendency nowadays with technology moving so quickly to expand uh, the areas covered by patent, copyright, uh, and trademark. That because the differences between these are becoming blurred. You know, it used to be you'd write a book and that's, that's, that's copyright. But now it's software. Uh, it's formulas. Um, there's, there's so many things that qualify uh, for um, uh, protection uh, simultaneously that sometimes things qualify for, to be protected under more than one uh, statute. They can, some things can be patented as well as copyrighted, and they can be uh, even trademarked. Um, and this gets back to what we were talking about before. One of the ways to get around the 20-year uh, limitation on patents uh, is to maybe see if your device or your invention can be copyrighted. If it can be copyrighted, what's the term? How long? Exactly. That's better than 20, right? And if you can trademark it, how long are those intellectual property rights protected? Exactly. Infinity. So with the, with the distinctions between copyright and patent and trademark law becoming more and more blurred, uh, and there being more creative ways to express the same idea in different ways, it's always a good idea to think to yourself, well, could this also be, could this device I've patented, could I also copyright it? For instance, the process. If, it, if it's a process, um, you might want to uh, consider writing it down and making it copyrightable. Um, so there are various ways of sort of getting, a, doing an end run around the limitations. Uh, and companies uh, uh, routinely uh, file for different types of protection involving the same uh, the, s the same device or the same uh, piece of intellectual property. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, question that, you know, like if you see Apple when they came up with uh, the iPod and all of a sudden you see um, Samsung, I, I don't think it lasted 20 years and they came up with the same thing. So how did they, they were able well, to get that? Well, we're, we're in fact, uh, we're just about to cover that. Let me see if I can cover that this way. Um, one of the things that, as I was just talking about, copyright law nowadays covers many things. Software, building designs, three-dimensional commercial products such as jewelry or a lamp, directories, compilations of fact, financial reports, music movies, pantomimes, choreography, photographs, sound recordings, even the bar exam uh, that I have to take, uh, all covered by copyright. But if, if you look at that list, a lot of those things also apply to devices. And would, be, and would qualify for either design 
uh, or um, our utility patents. So examples of uh, overlapping protection. Anybody recognize this? Exactly. Um, this is literally the image uh, from the design patent that was granted to Coca-Cola in 1916 by the US Patent uh, and Trademark Office. Um, it's uh, design patent number 63,657, uh, and um, it was subsequently registered as a trademark. Uh, so here's an example of how Coca-Cola has taken the iconic bottle and created a design patent, but also uh, they have, um, they've registered it as a trademark. By the way, um, I thought you might be interested in this. This is the original um, utility patent for the Coca-Cola bottle, which was uh, filed and uh, approved on November 16, 1915. Um, the interesting point about this is when they filed this, uh, the um, uh, in practical uh, application, the bottle wouldn't stand up because it was top heavy. So they actually had to change the shape of the bottle in order for it to stand up. If you filled that up with Coca-Cola, it would go over because of the hourglass shape. Uh, so over time, what they did is, uh, you know, they kind of changed the design with the US Patent and Trademark Office. But that's the original design uh, for the utility patent, number four, 48,000, think of it. There, at that point in time, there had only been 48,160 patents granted by the United States Patent and Trademark Office. This is, this is an old one. But every time they changed the design of the bottle, new design patent. Every time they tweak it, how many ridges does it have on it? What's the measurement between the ridges? How is the, how is the neck shape? New patent, new design patent. And the, and the time gets extended. Here's, uh, here's the Coca-Cola logo, uh, 19, 1893 to 1901. If um, you notice, Right here, if you can see it, in that little tail of the sea, it says trademark. Back in those days, you had to indicate that the mark was, was uh, trademarked. Nowadays, you don't have to do it. Remember, we talked about the little c, the tm, the r. Those things aren't even necessary. But as time has evolved, uh, the way you display a trademark has, this one has the words trademark on the tail of the sea. Uh, Here's the 1940s. Somebody came up with a brilliant idea at Coca-Cola. I guess no one was reading the trademark on the tail of the sea, so they made it a little bit more obvious. Um, again, this is a logo uh, pat uh, uh, trademarked with the United States Patent and Trademark Office in the 40s. Here's Coca-Cola from the 1970s, again, before any of you were born. But uh, this is, as you can see, the, um, the uh, trademark has changed a little bit. The style of the letters, they've taken the trademark off of the tail of the C. Again, a separate trademark. And here's the 1980s, and I think this is pretty much uh, uh, the way it is today, but you'll notice the little r indicating that this trademark has been registered with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. So um, I thought I'd play a little game. Uh, how many examples of intellectual property can you find in a Coke bottle? And I'll accept Pepsi bottle uh, uh, as well. Any, any ideas? Anybody want to help out here? Shape of the bottle, design patent. The, the, font. the font, trademark. You know, Coca-Cola received more than 100 patents last year. 100 patents to, issued to the Coca-Cola bottling company last year. And that's about constant since 1980. That's how many patents they own. How about, uh, how about what's in here? There, there, well, yes, there are trade secrets in there. Um, but here's some of the things that I came up with. The iconic logo, the bottle, the formula, which is a trade secret, the production methods. They are utility patents granted on the production method, methods. How do you get the CO2 in the bottle? Well, Coca-Cola invented its own process, which it patented. Um, methods of incorporating CO2, artificial sweeteners. 
there's a whole series of patents covering the ingredients in Coca-Cola. Not the formula itself, but the constituent ingredients, uh, the preservatives, dispensers and vending machines. Coca-Cola has more patents on dispensers and vending machines than they have on the, um, the, the uh, product itself. Um, and here's, uh, here's the patent for the high potency, potency sweetener composition with antioxidant and composition sweetened therewith, which was a patent filed in 1916, uh, 19, 2016 by Coca-Cola. Yes, sir, Brian. So there's a show on Discovery Channel, some of one of those channels called How It's Made. Yep. So oh, yeah, great they show. They go into all these factories and basically go step by step on how they do these things. Does it invalidate any of them? Well, if they're, if they're considered trade secrets, it would invalidate them. And in, on that same show, they did a show about um, the, the high-speed trains in, in Japan. And you know when the cameras came close to the uh, high-speed train uh, in the maintenance facility, they, they blacked it out in order to protect their proprietary information. Although if it's patented, it doesn't matter who sees it. No one can use it. But there are, there's patented technology and, and proprietary technology which they don't allow those shows to, uh, uh, to see. Uh, anything on those shows is basically off-the-shelf technology. And we've run out of time. I'm sorry. I wanted to get to the whole Bible thing that we talked about last week because I found it so interesting that I went and researched it. And the answers that we came up with intuitively were correct. But I'll cover that the next time just because it's a point of interest. Um, there's a whole body of intellectual property law that has uh, involved spiritual writing, and it has literally saved several religions. So I'll go into that the next time we sit down and talk. Anyhow, thanks for coming today. Have a nice weekend. Next week, I'm Thursday and Friday. Is that right? I think I'm Thursday and Friday. Next Monday is day off, so Tuesday is Monday. So since we're not meeting on Tuesday because it's Monday, we're meeting Thursday and Friday. And if that's clear to you, you're better than I am. Yes. Links are active on Stellar to upload the oh. half page um, uh, student paper topics and the one page models. Yes, for your, for your um, student assignments, uh, the links are active on the student website so you can upload your assignments. Really important. And just for everyone out there, this is uh, number three of the 12 lectures I'll be giving. Uh, next week we'll do number four and five. We're going to finish copyright and then, then we're going to get into patent law and we're going to patent our own, um, our own device. You're going to walk out of here knowing how to patent something. Even if you don't have any ideas worth patenting, at least you'll know how to do it. And if you don't have any ideas worth patenting, I guess that means you go to law school. So thank you very much. <laughs>